The craziest call I got was a girl, it sounded like she was like seventh or eighth grade or something, uh, wanted to know how to attract her boyfriend to her. This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. Russ Walter is the author of Secret Guide to Computers and Tricky Living, a book that he has been publishing and updating since 1972. It is currently in its 32nd edition. He's working on the 33rd now. The book has evolved with technology and time. The current versions cover modern machines like Windows, Android, and iOS. The early editions covered then-modern machines like the Atari 800, TRS-80, Commodore 64, and Apple II. In addition to the book, Russ provides a free technical support phone number, which he invites people to call at any time, day or night. My copy of the book from 1987 says, right on the cover, call 24 hours, he's usually in and sleeps only lightly. Though the phone number has changed, here it is some 30 years later, and that is still a feature that he offers. This interview took place on September 15, 2016. Basically, it started as a set of notes on how to write programs in BASIC. I was teaching in a prep school, and um, I just needed to make some notes for my students, so I did. And over time, the notes just got a lot longer, and the number of topics uh, broadened. So in the beginning, we just had a program in BASIC, because that was about all I knew about computers at that point. And then uh, later, I wound up at Wesleyan University, which um, has a, a, had a DEC System 10, which was a mainframe, and uh, people were doing all sorts of interesting stuff. They were all different programming languages, all different kinds of experiments with hardware and this and that. So I grew up a lot in my knowledge, and I learned by intimidation. Like people said, oh, you're nothing if you don't know Fortran. Oh, okay, fine. So you learned, oh, you're nothing if you don't know Algo. Oh, you're nothing if you don't know COBOL. So by a process of intimidation, I wound up learning a bunch of languages and then at one point created my own uh, called Easy, which I never implemented. I actually got a letter from somebody once who said they implemented it uh, somewhere. But the, um, that's how I, so at that point, the book was mainly about programming languages because it was the day of mainframe still. People weren't out to go buy a computer in their corner store. And then later I wound up... Um, as one of the editors of Personal Computing Magazine. And so when Personal Computing just started to become popular, I wound up as an editor for that and a reporter for that, uh, writing a bunch of articles about that. So I became very aware of the Personal Computing Marketplace. And then Boston Computer Society started up in Boston, and uh, people were playing with a lot of computers and interacting with each other and, and the, the Radio Shack, uh, their first computer got introduced there at, at the Boston Computer Society meeting. And so I, I got heavily involved with that and I was also still teaching at Wesleyan and people were suddenly buying personal computers for themselves. And I also gave a lot of courses all over the place. We had a whole bunch of computers, the Ataris and everything else. Um, so it became a uh, a fun kind of thing. You have like 30 different computers, all relatively cheap, uh, and you you get your hands on them, you try them out, you see how they're different. It was kind of a fascinating day. Now things are much more boring because basically you're down to either Windows or Mac or a smartphone. But in those days, there was a much richer variety of, of choices. So... Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how things started off. It began as notes and it got longer. And uh, I uh, at first just gave them to my students. Uh, then later, uh, Personal Computing Magazine, when I was in the process of leaving there, they said that as a favor for me, they'd let me run an, an ad for, for the books. So that was the first national advertising that I did. And um, I went to a lot of computer shows in those days, which I got introduced to through computer, Personal Computing Magazine. So I got to meet a bunch of people and gave a lot of seminars about how to use all these computers. So uh, things uh, just was really, they were exciting times then. And it was a niche market in the sense that the average American didn't care about all this stuff. 
but there was a very large minority that were fascinated by this stuff. And so uh, it was a, it was the heyday <laughs> of, uh, of fun learning about computers. And in those days, you, you wound up learning how to program because there weren't that many great programs that had been written. So people wanted to write programs to imitate their personality. And I tried to explain how the words like if, then, and go to, and print, and so on could make the computer imitate you. <laughs> and, you know, have people had a lot of fun with that. My students had a lot of fun making all sorts of interesting, crazy programs to have interesting conversations and create poetry and all this kind of stuff. So that was those days. Uh, these days, people tend to use the computer, unfortunately, just mainly as a way to send emails or text messages or, or whatever messages. And um, it's the, 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 the nature has degenerated into using the computer as ah, just another tool uh, to play with. But in those days, people did a lot more creative stuff. So that's quickly the history of it. And the books got um, bigger and bigger and bigger as I kept learning more and the field kept broadening to greater variety of people and greater variety of topics. So uh, it's really strange because in the beginning, the book began with how to program. That was the main thing. And now I had to shove most of that into the back of the book because the average person reading the book doesn't care. They just want to know that the most of the phone calls that I get for help are usually either, how do I use Windows 10? I'm totally frustrated with it. Um, before that, it was how to Windows 8. I'm totally frustrated with it. Before that, it was Windows 7. I'm totally frustrated with it. <laughs> um, and uh, a lot of the people that call me up are the elderly because they sort of miss the computer revolution and they don't have some cheery person right next to them to, to give them a hand. So they call me up, and uh, my books were very popular uh, in Arizona and Florida where all the retired people go. <laughs> and... Uh, so people in their 80s and 90s uh, were my main customers um, that needed the book, needed my free help. Uh, these days, a lot of people figure, ah, eh, if I have a question, I can just sort of look it up on the Internet or ask my next door neighbor or my roommate or my wife or husband or whatever, mm -hmm. or my kids. So, um, but in those, in, in those days, it was the more fascinating. Right now, um, the main problem that I have with this book is that, um, it is so cheap to distribute stuff by posting something on the internet and much more expensive to actually mail a printed book to somebody, both for the cost of the printing and the cost of the shipping. So um, the financially, things are working against me quite a lot right now, and I'm very puzzled about what to do, frankly, hmm. um, because uh, the people that, that have my books really love my books and really want it on paper. Uh, it's an amazing thing. But... Um, but a lot of younger folks figure, ah, why should, should I, you know, buy something on paper? I can just read so much crap on the Internet. Mm -hmm. My writing's better than what's on the Internet. But, um, and I do post part of my stuff on the Internet. But it causes a financial issue for me because people don't really want to pay to read something on the Internet. And I don't like the idea of paywalls either. Right. So I'm a little bit puzzled about what to do about all this. It's, the, the whole printing industry is kind of confused Have you tried about what to do about this. Have you tried print on demand, uh, like CreateSpace or something? Well, that's a lot more expensive. Um, the printing cost, I have a 700 page book here, and uh, my printing cost, I forget what it is. It's, I should look it up again. It's, um, I think it's like $3 and something. Um, to even print a tiny book on demand is like at least $8. So uh, it's much, much, much more expensive to print on demand. Um, so I, I needed to get the quantity printing prices that I'm used to, but I'm having trouble pushing the quantity out. The other problem with me is I don't have a marketer's personality anymore. Uh, I, I used to get really excited if I got a review somewhere or send out a mailing list, uh, whatever. And now when I've come up with a book, my main thought is, well, it's, Okay, but I wish it was better. <laughs> I'd like to work on the next one. <laughs> so I'm just I just don't have the right marketing personality. Also I used to live in Boston, which is more of a vibrant town. Now I'm in New Hampshire. Um so everybody here is just taking care of their lawn. The main intellectual question here is who has the greenest lawn and why? So um 
So I'm sort of in a less intellectual environment right now. Um, I mean, there are some intellectuals in New Hampshire Dartmouth College is there, for example, but, but um, um, I'm a little bit popular as to where to go. The other problem with me is that uh, I'm not a true, complete nerd. If, if, I, if I was a truly a real computer person, then every time something new comes out and computers get really excited, really got, want to get into it and so on. The problem that I have as a person is that um, um, computers were never my first love. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, we were driving in a car with uh, my father, I remember, and uh, he said, oh, are you forgetting the computers? And I said, oh, I don't, I'm just not interested in machines. I, I'm interested in things that are more intellectual. <laughs> so so uh, I never really had a real heart for it. And um, I, I was a math guy, invented a lot of original math stuff. And the reason I got into the computer field was I found I could do the most profound things about mathematics and nobody would care. And I could write the stupidest things about computers, like how to turn it on, and everybody wanted a copy. So I wound up in the computer field uh, somewhat reluctantly. And, um, but my interests are broader than that. I'm interested in foreign languages. I'm interested in religions. I'm interested in many, many, many topics. And uh, so in the, in the current secret guide, uh, there's a rather long section on called Tricky Living, which is everything that's not about computers. Of course, very often I'll have a, a link to, in there to some web page about the topic. But, mm -hmm. but um, my interests are much broader than this. And also, it used to be more fun to write about computers. I used to say, well, to do this, you type this. And now it's a matter of, well, to do this, you have to go find this crazy-looking icon, which you know Microsoft buried underneath some other icon. <laughs> and <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's not as fun a writing job. And sure, I could, I could do, you know... Uh, pictures of the icons in the book, but that starts getting a little tedious after a while. Sure. Uh, I noticed that so many uh, computer magazines and other things, they try to show screenshots to try to look realistic. And then the screenshots are so tiny, you can't read what the screenshot says anyway. So um, the whole thing is just kind of messed up. But there's some parts of the industry that I think are just really messed up. I think uh, when you get a computer these days, to try to get it, to find a reasonable tutorial on it, is difficult. I mean, you've got the dummies books. When they first came out, people thought I wrote them. People said, did you write those? I said, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but they're very, very similar in purpose, which is to help beginners. And the difference is that the dummies books are written uh, assuming you have a simple computer, it's just like the guy that wrote it. I mean, for example, I'm, I'm in the middle right now of documenting Windows 10, which I've been doing for many months now. But uh, I'm going through six different computers, totally different ones, and totally different ways they handle CDs. A lot of people don't even use CDs anymore, but uh, some of them still come with CD drives. And um, everybody's got their own way of doing it. It's not quite the same. The, the, the function keys are different. The, uh, the question of what program you use is different. Um, so uh, there's so many different uh, CD players, uh, software out there. Mm -hmm. So I'm documenting all these stupid differences and, you know, uh, and a lot of things that I, I wind up having to document little subtle differences that other books don't do. So this sort of ties me down, drags down the writing, makes it a little less pleasant to read, but more useful. Uh, by contrast, the tricky living part of the book is a lot more fun, um, where I talk about all sorts of things in life that are uh, a little less technical and just cheerier and more laughable to read about. Hmm. Like life hacks, that sort of thing? Well, um, I have so many topics in there. So there's, uh, there, I've got health, I've got government, I've got American cultures, I've got foreign cultures, I have uh, uh, morals, religion, sex, um, and what else is in here? Uh, all the arts, how to write. Hmm. Um, there's just so many topics. Well, I'm just looking at my table of contents here. I've got philosophy, psychologists, uh, jokes about physicists. Um, mathematicians, a lot of math stuff, some practical and some just more off the wall, uh, and all sorts of stuff there. Hmm. Um, and it's just, it's, it's, it's a, it's more of a fun read. Um, so I'm, you know, I, I sort of wish I didn't have to begin at the beginning. 
But I start with the serious stuff, you know, sure. what's the hard, what's hardware and this and that. And, you know, here's how you start using Windows. You click the start button, whatever it is. So the, the book I call, have... They can't even make up their mind what they call the button anymore. It used to be, they, it used to be called the start button. Now it's called the Windows button. I call it the Windows start button to try to cover both ends here. Right. But... So the version I have of your book is the 12th edition, which is 1987. <laughs> Which, well, you have only part of it then because it's a three-volume set. Oh, right. Yikes. So when was the first edition? Like what year about? Uh, the last page of the book will tell you, at least the last uh, page of my book does. I think it's 72. Hang on a second. Yeah, 1972. Wow. That was the original edition, which is now called retroactively called edition zero. <laughs> So and, and that said, was just 17 pages on how to write programs in basic for a, a Hewlett Packard mini computer. Wow. And uh, things got better after that. And, <laughs> and before I started recording, and I'm asking, hoping you'll repeat it, you said you're working on the 33 edition now. Right. Which is going right. to be a lot of Windows 10 stuff. Well, I shouldn't say a lot, but the, the, the main thing that I keep people asking me for is I get a lot of calls saying, hmm. I just got Windows 10. I don't understand it. Everything's not where I expect it to be. What do I do? I want to return this thing. I really hate it. Um, which I think is funny because Windows 10, it tries to combine the best of Windows 7 and Windows 8 into one package. But anytime you make any change, there's going to be a bunch of people that just, uh, just don't want to relearn it, even though the new system is somehow a little bit better than the old one in some ways. So, um, so that's the part that's the most you made the most marketable thing that's new. Like my old customers, the main reason they buy my new edition is because it's got Windows 10. Okay, um, I sort of lost the Mac crowd a long time ago because I used to have a, sec- a, a chapter on Macs, and the Mac people just think they know it all, think they don't need anything. And nowadays, the Mac people get really frustrated because if you go to a Mac from Windows, then you're totally lost again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyway, um, the uh, um, so the the main thing that's going to interest people is the Windows 10, but there's so many other things in here. Uh, as I said, I have the elections and, and different programming languages and updated a whole bunch of things in the book. Uh, so many things need updating. So, you know, the world keeps changing. Hmm. Because the last one, the 32nd, came out in February of 2014. So two and a half years ago. Hmm. So, okay, this is kind of random, but uh, this is an Atari podcast. Can Do you have any stories, memories, any particular thing about the uh, Atari 8-bit computers from back in the day? Well, they were, they were nice, um, and I had some, and um, I forget which ones I had. I had a bunch, and I think I still have them hiding in the basement. The... Um, um, the one problem that Atari ran into, the same problem that Texas Instruments ran into is, um, if I remember this right, is they did not use Microsoft for the, to develop the basic. And as a result, it was different. And as a result, in the long term, it sort of lost out on that. Um, the, um, I remember they had the cool graphics and the whole thing just looked cool in general. Um, I guess later it got outclassed by the Amiga, but the Amiga was at a higher price point. Mm-hmm. Um, the um, So not that many people bought Amigas, I don't think, compared to the other ones that were on the market at the time. I did not buy an Amiga. The... Um, um, so that was Jack Tremiel, right? I'm just trying to remember all this. It's been a while. Was Nolan, um, Nolan Bushnell started the company, then it was sold to Warner. Oh, I'm sorry, Jack. Jack well, I'm sorry, Jack was the uh, was the Commodore. Well, well, it was sold to Warner, and then Warner sold it to Jack Tremiel, who had left Commodore at that yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> Refresh my memory on it. It's been a while. So I guess your guys still have a lot of them. They kick around and have a lot of fun playing the old stuff. Huh? Yeah, playing and programming, and uh, yeah, it's they're still a fun machine. And of course, there's also communities yeah. out there for the TI and for the TRS-80 and and uh, yeah, retro yeah. computing. Um, I, I think the I think the Atari had more of a fun feel to it than some of the others did, though. 
um, I mean, the Radio Shack was never marketed as fun. It was marketed as, you know, I don't know. They they marketed it more to try to get business people. I remember that uh, one when the TRS-80 first started, uh, when it first came out, some guy bought one at the first show. And uh, I think he was the head of a police department. And when he was walking out, he said, oh, by the way, how do you program it? <laughs> but he's got like a quick answer. Sure. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, I think uh, the the Radio Shack uh, had to broaden out and appeal to the general market and how to use this for some sort of business oriented use. Whereas Atari never tried to do that. I think they tried to keep it on the fun angle. Right. Um, and uh, uh, just getting back to one of your other questions, uh, you asked why I do all this aside from just helping my students. Yeah. Um, why I give the free help. There are three reasons, if I can remember what they were. Um, but one is that I like to be a nice guy. Uh, another is when people ask me questions, that lets me know what's on people's mind and what needs to be improved in my book if it's not there already. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's really useful feedback to me which is totally different feedback than you get from reading the magazine articles and newspaper articles to try to report what's going on. Um, and then, um, and then the third reason is that when people call me up and I give them free help, that usually motivates them to get a book for me eventually, mm. um, either a new edition or they'll tell the friend, Hey, call Russ. He, he gives free help. And I do. Mm. Um, but eventually, it just it just broadens my you know PR and and gets people interested in me, and eventually sure. they buy a book out of me either because they really need it or just out of sympathy. <laughs> I I get that, but I I can see that being uh, something that seems like a good idea in 1980. But I mean, you stuck with it for so long, and you must have gotten it. You know, and it's, it literally says you can call day or night, 24 hours. It, so well, that's true, and. Yeah, they, 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 I think, this, this, I think a, a, a regular person would have gotten sick of it by now, and I'm just insanely curious about why you haven't and uh, about strange calls you've gotten at four in the morning. Well, yeah, uh, on the strange calls, I think the the most interesting one, since I give uh, help on everything, not just computers, I think the craziest call I got was a, uh, a girl, it sounded like she was like seventh or eighth grade or something, um, teenager called up and uh, wanted to know how to attract her boyfriend to her. Uh, she, she, there's a guy that she was hot on and she wanted to know what to do to get him interested. So I gave her some advice. And then uh, she, she called a few months later and said, well, she got him, but now she's tired of him. How do I dump him? <laughs> so, I thought that was interesting. Um, but I get all sorts of calls. I get a lot of paranoid people call up. How do I protect my computer from government snooping? How do I protect it from people that are going to steal my credit cards? Um, Get a lot of really scared, paranoid people that uh, usually are a little bit off the wall. They're a little extreme. Um, um, I get a lot of calls from people that want to get into a computer career and they don't know uh, where to start on that or what the best way in is. My usual advice for that is, Start, if you never don't know much about computers, start by, after you get comfortable with the fundamentals, try to create web pages. And then um, that, so many other skills come into that, like to make it graphically interesting, to create mail, to create a list of people to call. There's so many other parts of the in, of uh, computer technology and software that, that come into that, that that's a, uh, something to hang on to that'll, um, that will eventually broaden you and make you very marketable because you'll pick up a lot of skills in the, in the process of trying to broaden out which, and improve whatever you've done already. Um, I get uh, um, I get people that will come and call me up and try to argue with me, about, try to get me to uh, become more Christian. Um, a hmm. bunch of religious people will call up. Um, I do get calls from all over the world, and uh, that's always fascinating for me. I like international cultures. So at one point, people in Ghana thought I was some sort of a rich god or something. 
because they kept sending me photographs of themselves and so on. And could you please give me a computer? And, you know, they wanted me to ship a free computer to them for Ghana. They thought I was a big philanthropist and they didn't realize I'm not a rich guy, (laughs) but, but, um, um, and a lot of uh, thousands of books were sold in Ghana, uh, at, at a, you know, like 20 years ago, whenever it was, but there, there, there was a, a period there where they were really, really popular there. Um, and, um, so I don't know, I get all sorts of calls about all sorts of things. Um, one guy I'd still, uh, once in a while I get a call that embarrasses me cause they point out I made a mistake. So, um, the, uh, the guy who was in charge of the Radio Shack computer at Radio Shack, at Tandy, uh, eventually uh, contacted me and said that some of the stuff I had about him in the book was not correct, that he just didn't just go steal stuff from Commodore. Um, <laughs> that, uh, so, okay, fine. And um, also uh, some professor or somebody, something like that, called up and said he didn't like my explanation to see that, that it uh, was not the, the the programming method I had for, for creating functions, your own functions was uh, not up to the current standard of how it ought to be done. And I got a bunch of other criticisms, which is good, you know, and there are some parts of the book that I'm, that I'm weak at uh, and people keep reminding me of things. Um, uh, my wife is Chinese and she's very heavy into WeChat, which is the main social media method in China, which, uh, she thinks is better than than all the American ones, and a lot of people think the same way. So uh, you know, better than FaceTime, better than mm-hmm. than the various messengers here. So um, and we use that. Uh, as a long story, but uh, people keep feeding me interesting criticisms. Um, oh, one of the interesting ones was uh, a computer club in California wanted to use my book and distribute it to their members. And one guy there was a rabbi who was also a member of the American Civil Liberties Union, and he wanted my book to be banned because he thought it was anti-Jewish, which I thought was funny because I'm Jewish myself, sort of. (laughs) But um, there are a bunch of cynical comments. I I try to have cynical comments about everything that I write as well as positive comments. So he didn't like the cynical comments about Judaism and uh, thought it was too anti-Jewish. So the club, uh, I forget what the club finally did about that, but, um, but that was an interesting uh, case. So one person called up and said it was uh, uh, he, on my nutrition section in my tricky living. He said that uh, it was the best explanation he ever read of nutrition. He was a nursing student. So he thanked me for that. He said it was better than all the textbooks. I got a call, uh, um, from some woman about a week ago, uh, I just, since I don't have a windows 10 book out yet, I just walked her through on the phone, how to get comfortable with the windows 10 screen and where things are and how they're hiding. <laughs> so, so she said, Oh, wow. Thank you so much. I learned more from you in the last half hour than I learned in the, in the, all my previous lifetime. Okay. Well, that's an exaggeration obviously, but, uh, thanks. Um, I don't know. Um, it's, uh, it's been fun. I used to go around at, at uh, computer shows uh, wearing uh, a witch's costume and roller skates and an African spear and, and whatnot and, uh, and created a bit of a, a crazy sensation for myself. Those were fun days. Fun. But um, right now, I have just, I, part of my problem is I'm, I'm torn between different responsibilities um, between this book and then my wife runs a restaurant which I sometimes have to help her run and I've got some other responsibilities here now uh, which broadens out the tricky living part of the book I'm getting exposed to more things I'm was, I was raised in a democrat culture well I shouldn't say raised in but I lived among democrats in Boston like most people in Boston are democrats and now I'm living in a republican environment here <laughs> so mm-hmm. it's interesting to, to see how, see both sides of the story so uh, it's, uh, that's where things are. People call me up, but because the, the book has become less popular recently, one of the things that uh, disappointed me was there used to be uh, on Wikipedia, there used to be a, a, a big uh, page about me. 
that I did not write. I mean, some, one of my fans wrote this and it was pretty accurate. Um, and Wikipedia eventually took it down. Uh, they, they said it seemed too biased. It was based too much on one or two sources and so on. So I was a little disappointed that I sort of have already died, at least as far as Wikipedia is concerned. Mm. So um, I'm sad about that. There's a bunch of other things I'm kind of sad about. Uh, parts of the industry are still messed up. I, uh, um, I, I keep using, um, for payroll, I keep using QuickBooks. But, boy, that program just does so many things that makes people want to punch them in the face. Um, and uh, they just a whole bunch of issues I have with that program. And then... Um, um, I'm so disappointed that the industry never uh, is not using an easy to use database program. So a lot of people just give up and, and try to force Excel spreadsheet to do database stuff. Um, Microsoft came out with access many years ago, which would have died quickly because it's kind of awful uh, compared to the other things that were on the market at that time. But just because it was marketed by Microsoft, it, it became sort of the default. Um, and a bunch of, I just really disappointed that you, uh, I still use Q and a, which is an old DOS based program that mm-hmm. was in its day was considered wonderfully easy and amazing. And a lot of people, a lot of journalists uh, said, wow, you know, I have to admit that I use Q and a, but, uh, uh, anyway, it's not marketed anymore, although there's some imitations that are being marketed, but, um, I don't know. I just, I just feel that certain parts of the industry have fallen down. The whole idea of easy programming is, has, fallen away um basic in some ways was easy in some ways there were some awkwardnesses um but the world has moved on to uh to see which is a lot uglier uh to start with and then you have python which is sort of a compromise but parts of python are and parts of every language are ugly but i just uh, am surprised that um that the old idea that Little kids should be learning basic and 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 uh, or logo or something that um, that those ideas have gone away. I realize that there are a bunch of substitute languages that keep getting pushed here and there uh, from Apple and others, but um, but I just felt I just feel something is 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 lost there. Um, mm-hmm. So I just think that uh, stuff is too complicated. Um, you try to look at a Windows 10. I mean. You know, even with Windows 10, to shut it down, you've got to say start, right? <laughs> I mean, right. who invents shit like this? <laughs> and there's just so many other crazy examples of this where things just get hidden in strange places. Um, and uh, But the, uh, I guess the part of the problem was when they wanted to make things international, they tried to get away from words because they were to be in English, and maybe some of the people mm-hmm. speak Spanish or speak other languages. Mm-hmm. So, um, so you look at a screen now, and you got all these little crazy doohickeys, and you don't know what they are. You try to hover the mouse over them, and maybe you get a clue. But um, it's just um, it's it's harder to use than it used to be. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, yeah. those are some thoughts on the matter. All right. But cool. um, I just anyway, um, so that's where I am. I still give the free help at all hours of the day and night, and. Uh, Sometimes my wife gets a little bit annoyed <laughs> at, at getting woken up by a phone call, but it's uh, but it's fine with me, so I, I don't mind at all. Nice. So go ahead and call. All right. awesome. And it is free help. Uh, the only there are three catches, as I say in the book. Uh, catch number one is I can't help you do something that I don't recommend doing, like using pirated software or using software that I think is really a terrible, terrible choice for what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, second thing is, um, if the answer's in the book, I'll take the liberty of recommending you look at the book. Some of it's posted online. You can go ahead and look at that for free. And the third catch, what's the third catch? I don't remember. But, um, um, oh, yes, I'm limited to an average of seven minutes a call, but often go on much longer. If somebody wants help with their career or help with their life and boyfriends or or they want to commit suicide or whatever it is, um, you know, I'll spend a lot of time trying to help that person. Um, uh, and uh, I often go on longer, but I, I just need to keep it, keep it down sometimes. Uh, um, so it's very helpful if you're by the computer when you call. Um, 
so that I can give you more help in telling you what to do to try to resolve your computer problem. Sure. Well, excellent. I, I hope so that, that's a limitation. I hope that your next edition is a, is a huge hit. I think I have one last question for you. Sure. Um, if you could send a message to the Atari community that still exists, and you can right now, what would you tell them? That needs thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would just say keep at it, do something fascinating, and blow people away. Um, and there's so many ways to try to do that. You know, these days... Um, Crazy things get a lot of attention if they're crazy enough. And, um, for example, I just read an article about giving a list of all the crazy things that computers are, are doing right now. Um, you think that who the hell wants to do that? But they get a lot of attention just because they're different and weird. And um, it doesn't have to be on a standard machine either. And so maybe it will inspire people to do it on other machines. But just go ahead and do something really interesting and weird that really fascinates it, fascinates people. Show it to your roommate or, or friends or whatever, if they can think, hey, this is really cool, and ask them how could, could it be improved. Like, oh, this is cool. Uh, hey, wouldn't it be great if it also did this or something? You know, get some feedback um, on what you're doing, and uh, and then improve it further, and uh, and then just blow people away. So that's what I would do. Awesome. Good answer. Thank you so much, Russ. Good luck. If you enjoyed these interviews and would like to contribute something, I encourage you instead to donate to one of our favorite organizations, the Internet Archive, at archive.org. The Internet Archive is a nonprofit digital library with the stated mission of universal access to all knowledge. They've done incredible things to preserve computer history, including hosting thousands of programs in an in-browser Atari emulator, creating the Wayback Machine, and offering full-page scans of countless Atari computer books and magazines. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org donate.